I mentioned in my 2020 year-end recap that after I finally acquired a capture card, the thing I wanted to do most was to be able to capture footage from one of my favorite childhood consoles, the Sega Saturn, of course. You are approaching Saturn. You are only seconds away. I have arranged for you to meet my... companion. Yeah, I'll admit it. I was a Sega kid growing up. Didn't have a Nintendo console beyond the NES all the way to the GameCube era. We Sega kids are a rare breed these days, that's for certain. While most kids were crushing out with their NESs and SNESs and N64s, I was in the trenches with the Genesis and Saturn. Never had a Dreamcast, though I did get into every other console of that generation. I'll stand up for the Sega consoles, though. They had a ton of cool games on them. So it's time to actually start dredging them up for my channel. Oh, but where to start? Saturn was a pretty big console for me as a kid, after all. I definitely spent way too many hours playing it. Hmm. Ah, of course, Clockwork Knight, one of my definite favorite Sega Saturn titles. Originally released in Japan on November of 1994 and followed up with releases in the USA on May 11th, 1995, and in Europe on July 8th of the same year. I played this game as a kid and its sequel a ton. It was basically an adjunct to Toy Story for me, which Toy Story was my favorite movie as a kid. Even though they really had nothing in common other than toys come alive and do stuff. On top of the fact that Toy Story didn't even come out till a year after Clockwork Knight. Pixar, do you have something you want to tell the class? Anyway, Clockwork Knight stars the titular Clockwork Knight himself, Sir Tengara de Pepperachu III, this handsome fella right here on the front of the cover. Pepper is one of two knights alongside Ginger that's been vying for the affection of Princess Chelsea, the fair maiden in a cuckoo clock whose sweet singing voice awakens every toy in the house for playtime. The toys of the house are happily reveling in fun when suddenly the lights go out and oh no, Chelsea is kidnapped by mysterious forces. Being the honorable knights that they are, Pepper and Ginger mount their noble steeds and ride off to rescue the princess. Unbeknownst to them though, a sinister force grips the other toys. Now, near alone in a big house full of evil toys, Sir Tengara de Pepperachu draws his keyblade and readies himself for a most daring adventure. Do you have something you want to tell the class, Kingdom Hearts? You begin your quest in Betsy's room, the room of a little girl, presumably. Clockwork Knight controls fairly simply, one button for jumps, one button for a quick stab attack. You can also strike low if you're crouching, run, and if you mash your attack button, Pepper will continuously spin his keyblade. He also does that low as well. Your other method of attacking enemies is picking up objects to beam your foes with. You can also do this with enemies you've stunned with a basic attack too. At the end of every level, there's a little mini game where you need to land on the correct letter to spell Clockwork Knight, and doing so rewards you with a 1-up. The rooms are pretty expansive, with multiple routes available in each. These rooms also reward exploration, since more more hidden routes tend to hold gold keys, which expand your life bar. You can also find bottle caps, which can be used for gambling. Gambling, well, maybe not gambling in the traditional sense of slots or crafts, but more like that street game with the playing cards and the skeevy dealer trying to steal all your money. Between every level, you could spend money to do this gambling that's offered by Soltia, a voluptuous perfume bottle. You can spend up to 15 coins to better your chances of getting more money or additional lives, as well as just losing. You can also grab clocks, which extend the time limit of a given level, so you can explore more and find more things. Lastly, there's also this little orb, which makes you completely invincible, unless you plow through enemies for fun. And now with mechanics out of the way, allow me to gush for a while. I might be a bit biased, since I just completely love the aesthetic of being a little toy in a normal human world. You know what I mean, stuff like Toy Story, Army Men, Mean Greens, or Pikmin even. I'm not sure why, I guess I just find it super endearing being a toy that has to navigate perils that are only an obstacle to you, because well, you're a damn teeny tiny toy. You'll shove big heavy books, platform across dishes to avoid rising water, and ride trains across massive toy train tracks constructed by a kid with too much time and just enough imagination. To go on an aside for the bit, the sound design in this game is absolutely stellar. From the enemy squeals to the boss noises, the pickup sounds, and my personal favorite, the great popping noise that accompanies every enemy dying. <laughs> It's all just so good. That and the music too. My god, the music is freaking stellar in this game. Some of the best I've ever heard from just a random title, you know? Your journey across the house will lead you to Kevin's room next, then to the kitchen, up to an attic, and lastly to a den for the game's final boss. Throughout the various rooms of the house, you'll do battle with, what else? Various toys and gadgets, I think, that have gone rogue after being tainted by the darkness at the start of the game. These toys are, um, let's say perfectly touched by that fun brand of Japanese weirdness we're all familiar with, with them mainly being kind of blocky, classical-looking toys. These little knights wielding pen 
pencil lances, toy helicopters, and these weird clowns and cans, which, did any kid ever actually like clowns? Honest question. Things do get a bit weirder in terms of enemy as the game goes on, though, with these spoony bears that pop out of honeypots to attack you. Follow these up with chain snakes? The fuck? That occupy the home's attic. Not really sure what these are supposed to be, truth be told. Ah, my favorite kid's toy, though. Literal explosive device. And my other favorite kid's toy, propelled explosive device. Partially incubated chicken with sausage feet. And there's the boss at the end of every room. These range from this radical mecha here. They're just kind of weird ones, you know what I mean? <laughs> Japanese game out in full force with the weirdness in this one. At the climax of Clockwork Night, you'll fight this thing here, an analog TV in the den. It attempts to smash you with a VHS tape. Anyone watching this know what that is aside from me? Thankfully, you're smarter and make him smash his tape down to sharpen pencils until he dies. The TV violently explodes and you rescue Princess Chelsea. Yeah, that's the game. Looking back, it's actually pretty short. Like, maybe over an hour if you're really bad at it, like me. Thankfully, though, Clockwork Knight wasn't a one-pump chump and managed to squeak out a sequel. Titled, of course, Clockwork Knight 2. This is the first video with more than one game reviewed during it. Well, isn't that special? Two picks up right where one left off, with the good guys desperately attempting to wake Princess Chelsea from her seemingly endless slumber. <laughs> God damn it, we just rescued her! So your adventure must begin once again. You might ask, what's new in this title versus the first though? Well, it does still function the same as the first, so no worries in new controls there. Enemies are also pretty much the same. Fair, fair. As for new stuff, there are now playing cards scattered across the levels, which you must sprint across to collect. Collecting all 32 of these cards lets you a cheat code, which if you enter, gives you the ability to select whatever level you'll want to play. Pepper's Donkey Barabaro serves a point in this game as well, being featured in several riding levels. Barabaro also gets in on the violence by firing his head at opponents here. Take that, you squad of octopi. You also have four new levels to explore, a generic unnamed kid's room. Guess that makes three now, unless this is just a playroom for Kevin and Betsy or something. You go through the den, which was barely at the end of the first game. I like the den sections a lot, since you're dropping books on enemies, and for some reason there's cannons that fire you to and from the foreign backgrounds. As well as a brief section where you carry a Zippo lighter to light the area. Maybe this game is what started my weird obsession with Zippos. Then, probably my favorite level in all of these games, truth be told, the bathroom. The truth to be told, this bathroom is more like a spa than anything. It's massive! It does have similar mechanics to the kitchen from the first game, with the rising and falling water tides, but with more fun aesthetics. Like these big sudsy sponges that fire out bubbles when you hop on them. The rubber duckies, which obviously. And these squeaky rubber turtles, which the ultimate level of level 2 is a clock tower. Holy hell, what kind of palatial estate do I take up residence in? The clockwork though has some of the most intense platforming segments I've ever done in any game. Like ass-clenchingly intense. These towers right here? I hate these towers. You gotta crank them back till they have a platform on your level and then crank it forward and begin hopping up the platforms. The first one isn't too bad, but the second one, do it again but with half the surface area. Good luck. Hop across little slick surfaces, evade swinging guillotines, all the while getting harassed by Ticonderoga knights and choppers. Then hop from gear to gear, which it doesn't even seem like you can jump between sometimes. Yeah, I was sweating while doing these jumps. Although the boss is in two far more than first as well. They're just the right amount of weird and fun. First and foremost is this crooning wooden snake who has a great death animation. <laughs> Followed by the origami animals of the den. I love this battle. Some sentient paper inks itself up in a color and then folds into an animal to attack you. The first being a gorilla who cross thrusts, tries to slam his body on top of you, and will command grab you if you stay close for too long. And a jaguar, and this is another one of those ass clenching challenges. You always have to jump over the jaguar to make it crash into the wall so you can attack it. it never seems like you have enough vertical leap to get over, but you always just do. It was nerve-wracking, even when I was more confident with my jumps. And the last form is a bat, which oddly is the least intimidating of the three, as well as the easiest to deal with. It'll drop a spike ball, which will explode into an egg. You pick up the egg, and then you throw it at him. Egg on his face, am I right? Not to be outdone, though, in the bathroom you do battle with a giant octopus who hurls bars of soap at you while banging music plays in the backgrounds. <laughs> Totally radical. At two's climax, though, you'll get a final boss truly befitting of any knight. A fire-breathing junk dragon. One you realize is piloted by a fellow knight when you take the head off. And you slay the beast, and it turns out it was actually piloted by a knight. Your grandfather, Sir Tungara de Peparachu the First, under the influence of the evil force, of course. You also rescue Chelsea once again, but she's still stuck in her never-ending slumber. Pepper the First reveals in the first ever cutscene with actual dialogue in this series that Princess Chelsea can only be awakened by winding her with the key of her brother, Ginger. Wait a minute.
Is it incest if you're a toy? The game ends with Chelsea finally being revived and things being at peace across the house. Give a round of applause to our players, everybody. Beyond the main game, Clockwork Knight 2 offers a boss endurance mode to play where you fight the bosses from both 1 and 2. You also get the option to play Ginger in this mode. Ginger runs faster, jumps higher, has a better attack sequence, and can even double jump too. Beyond this mode, if you clear it without dying once that is, you get a code that will let you unlock a bevy of mini games to play. All of them are pretty fun, except the racing time trial one because I don't like hearing this constantly. <laughs> My favorite's probably Forks, though. All the backgrounds in these minigames look like crayon drawing placeholders done by the programmers that they didn't want to replace because it was funny. Which I agree, it's pretty funny. I appreciate the canon one too since you're using very clearly terrified pepperachus as ammunition to kill, I don't know, what are these, the tips of ink pens? Jump is a pretty funny minigame too, but I don't know why the game calls these mosquitoes and not wasps. And yeah, I think that's all I can say about Clockwork Knight 1 and 2. I found out later on that Clockwork Knight, in addition to 1 and 2, had a title where they smashed both games together, but it was Japanese exclusive. This package called Clockwork Knight Pepperacho no Fukubukuro, literally translated as Pepperacho's Grab Bag, seems like it's how it should have been, truth be told. I've read that the first Clockwork Knight was rushed to be a launch title for the Sega Saturn, and honestly, that makes sense to me. The first does seem a bit short, and the second adds a ton of content that would have made for a more complete experience. I also found out the game had a sequel planned and partially developed too. Called by fans Clockwork Knight the Pingu War, it was a Saturn title that unfortunately never saw the light of day, though a playable Ron dump of the title was released pretty recently. It's nothing like the originals, it being a puzzle game in the vein of Sega's Pango title, that's the name Pingu I guess. You just have to clear a level of enemies by kicking Lego studs at them. It does keep to a similar level pattern of the originals, with a handful of normal levels and then a boss one at the end. In addition to that, another Clockwork Knight game was also in development a GameCube title called Night and Night. It was announced, but unfortunately got lost in the shuffle when its developer Overworks was restructured into Sega WoW, which later split into two divisions. Unfortunate, really. Clockwork Knight, for all two of its games, was a silly, lighthearted romp that was so much fun and just so packed with charm. I guess if there was any flaws for me to point out, it would be the controls can be kind of sticky at times, but it's something you can adjust to pretty easily. Outside of that, they're incredibly fun, and the music and sounds are completely top-notch. I haven't even mentioned it, really. Every track in this game is a fucking banger. I'd kill for this game to get an HD remake, or even an Honest to God sequel now. I think these two titles are ripe for a remake, and this is the sort of title that should be remade, something that could use a little bit of improvement and be introduced to a new generation. Not a blockbuster like Mass Effect or The Last of Us. Anyway, that was a trip down memory lane for me. As I always say, I'm Ages Manticore, this here channel is City State Manticore. Leave a like and a comment if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you want more content from me. It's a ton for watching, and I'll see y'all in the next video. Goodbye.